For Harry Gordon Selfridge, shopping was an act of theater. In 1906, he was living in semi-retirement, following a successful retail career in America. On a visit across the Atlantic, he was shocked by how poorly England's department stores compared to those in other great cities in the US and Europe. Spotting a gap in the market and keen to take on a new challenge, he decided to launch his own. He came bursting full of ideas and very much a more relaxed approach to shopping in general. So his whole concept of, of the department store was revolutionary at the time. It became more of a, uh, an experience of, of a day out. The setting for that experience would be everything. Selfridge chose a site on the then unfashionable western end of Oxford Street. He planned to construct a London store second only in size to Harrods, but grander than any retail rival anywhere. I mean, his vision was basically to create the most impressive, most uh, grandiose department store in the world, almost like the, the dream of a man obsessed with creating a huge landmark. You could almost imagine that, that the reason why he was doing this was to turn his uh, department store into the Cathedral of Shopping. London's council planners rejected those designs. In a way, I, I kind of feel sorry that he, that somebody with that kind of vision wasn't able to get his way. But the plans that did get approval would result in the instantly recognizable building that stands today. With over 600,000 square feet of retail space, it remains the biggest store on Oxford Street. A series of unique details gave the building its distinct appearance, as well as advantages over rivals. It was the UK's first steel frame department store, and its skeleton frame construction meant it wouldn't require load-bearing walls. Because of that structure, internally, the departments were a lot larger. This was actually designed to be spacious. When you walk into that grand entrance, something takes over you. It is a, it, it's dramatic, it's wonderful. After just two years, the Selfridges store was finished. During the countdown to opening day, its owner embraced marketing like no one had before, splashing out on a series of ads and promotions. The bill came to around £5,000, equivalent to over half a million pounds today. He spent more money than anybody had ever spent in the history of retailing. He created a newspaper advertising for the retail industry. He had to convince the public. His high-stakes gamble worked. On opening day, March the 15th, 1909, 90,000 people queued to get in. Flags were flying from the roof, ruched theatre curtains were pulled up. He was putting on a show, you know, Harry Selfridge was a showman, and the curtain was going up on his performance. There were nine Otis lifts, would take people up to the fourth floor where there was a restaurant, and this was completely unheard of. Telephones on every counter so that the buyer could telephone for stock or help. No other store that had an information room. And, you know, you could ask anything you wanted. I mean, how many miles is it to Nairobi? Or where is Maud Allen dancing next? It had 100 departments, a roof garden, reading rooms, and even a reception area for foreign visitors. You could buy theatre tickets. You could buy your tickets for the liner to go to New York. So it was uh, like being in a luxury hotel. For the first time, a department store was selling a lifestyle. But for Harry Selfridge, shifting product was key.
In France, Louis Blériot prepared for a flight across the English Channel. He took off without a compass, setting a course for the cliffs of Dover. Just four months after the store opened, French aviator Louis Blériot made history by becoming the first man to fly across the Channel. His achievement caught the public's imagination and Selfridge capitalized by putting the plane on display. Within just four days, 150,000 shoppers had flocked to see it. The Selfridge is all about spectacle. He has Blériot's plane in store. You can imagine that just would have blown people's minds at the time. So it's always more than about shopping with Selfridge. As aviation advanced, there were a string of other scientific breakthroughs, and Selfridge was ready to take advantage. Being a technology freak as he was, and the era was poised on the, you know, the sort of cusp of such thrilling excitement. In 1925, Selfridge met with a broke Scottish engineer, struggling to get anyone to take his invention seriously. His name? was John Logie Baird, the father of television. The store owner agreed to take a chance on him and his strange new device. Gordon Selfridge saw that there was something going on uh, with television and it was going to be a major invention. He looked at it as something akin to having Blériot's monoplane on display in the shop. Selfridge paid Baird in the region of £3,000 in today's money to demonstrate his televisor to curious customers inside the store. In giving Logie Baird his opportunity, Mr Selfridge had shown himself to be a champion of the underdog, and that was nothing new. From the outset, he proved to be a friend of his shop floor staff. Life for shop assistants in the early 20th century is pretty tough. They're on their feet most of the day, and that, that day is often 10, 12, 13, 14 hours long. Their pay is very low, so long hours, low pay, poor living conditions, and having to smile all the time. Selfridge gave women opportunities they couldn't find elsewhere. Not only did he offer them better roles, working as buyers and famously as lift attendants, they enjoyed improved working conditions overall. Selfridge was one of the first to professionalise the world of the shop assistant. So he introduced training courses, uh, travel packages, sent his uh, staff off to Paris to go and look at the, the stores there. So he treated his workers with probably more respect than many of his competitors. When he was interviewed about women's suffrage, he said, how could I not support the suffrage movement? I have a wife, a mother, and three daughters at home. Of course I support it. The Votes for Women movement also had at least one prominent supporter behind the counters of his store. Gladys Evans is one of Selfridge's most famous staff, and she was not just a suffragette supporter that marched, but a suffragette who really nailed her colours to the mast and took direct action. In 1912, she travelled to Dublin with uh, a group of supporters to disrupt uh, a speech to be given by Asquith, the British Prime Minister. They uh, throw a missile through the window of his carriage. Uh, he's not injured. They um, then travel in advance to the theatre where he's due to speak and they set fire to it so that he cannot speak then. Even though no one was hurt in the incident, the response was heavy. Gladys Evans was sentenced to five years in prison. As she went on hunger strike for 58 days, her Selfridge's colleagues wrote letters calling for her release. So it's a really important episode because here's someone who someone else might have sacked and Selfridge doesn't sack her and Selfridge allows his staff to support her and I think that's very significant. The protests worked. Evans was released after only 16 weeks behind bars. She would then go on to help secure the right of women to vote. And people like Gladys, you know, the ordinary shop assistant, play a really important part in the suffrage struggle. So although there are famous leaders, the Pankhurst and so on, that people have heard about, it's really people like Gladys and thousands like her who are really moving that struggle forward. 